for coming out. We want to try to make this irksome task become just a little bit easier. We all struggle with evangelism, so uh, hopefully we can gain a little bit of steel, skill, a little bit of motivation tonight. First, what is evangelism? I can't improve on Max Stiles' definition. I'm actually dependent on Max Stiles quite a bit tonight. He's the best evangelist I know, and he simply defines evangelism this way. He says it is sharing the gospel with the aim to persuade. Pretty simple. Sharing the gospel with the aim to persuade. Packer has a little more beef on it. He says uh, evangelism, according to Paul, was going out in love as Christ's agent in the world to teach sinners the truth of the gospel with a view to converting and saving them. It's a good definition. Open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is not going to be a sermon by any means, but this is going to be sort of a, a guiding passage for us tonight. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21. Hear what the Holy Spirit says through the Apostle Paul. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But we, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All right, so I want us to plow through six points. Got a lot of content here. Six points. I'll have them on the slides, but here they are. Fear the Lord. Pray. Know the gospel. Be bold ask questions, and make disciples. All right, so first, fear the Lord. Paul said, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What is the main reason why we don't evangelize? I want, I want to hear. We're in here so that we can have a good recording, but I want to hear from you. Pretend we're back over in the fellowship hall. What's the main reason we don't share the gospel? Fear, fear right? We're scared. Fear of man is what... It's been called historically fear of people. What's the antidote to fear of man? Say louder. Fear of, God greater. fear of God, yeah. Fear God greater, yeah. The antidote to the fear of man is the fear of God. What's the fear of God? It's this reverential awe. It's not this paralyzing fear. It's a reverential awe for him. It's to revere him. It's to, def it's to fear displeasing him. It's a foundational eagerness to glorify God in all of life. And so first, we need to fear God, not people. And when we think about it, it makes sense, right? It's just a reminder. We've got to remind ourselves regularly. We're just talking to people here. We fear the Lord. What's the worst that could happen? In some places, bad things could happen. In some places, martyrdom. Could happen. Many places in the world. There's been more martyrs in the last 200 years than there have been the history of the whole Christian church. But that's probably not going to happen here. <laughs> Quite unlikely, unlikely. Here, you might get made fun of. It might be a little awkward. But awkward is always better than silent. D. James Kennedy, pastor in Florida, used to say, most of the world fears the raised fist. Americans fear the raised eyebrow. It's a good word. So fear the Lord, first and foremost. Fear the Lord. Number two, pray. Pray. In evangelism, we must pray. There are many things to pray for, but most importantly, as you go, pray that God would save. Pray that God would save people. 
because we're desperate without the work of the Spirit. And this is important for understanding evangelism, rightly. We really need to understand conversion. How is it that God saves people? We're aiming to persuade, right? It's our definition, sharing the gospel with an aim to persuade. And so we want to see God save people. We want to see God convert people. And that's the key. It's God who converts. Conversion is of the Lord. It's his doing. Flip over to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. This is who we were. This is who we're talking to in evangelism. Here's a description. What are we up against? Ephesians 2, 1. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There it is. We are going about and talking to people who are dead in sin, dominated by Satan, and doomed to the wrath of God. That's what we're working with, dead people. We're going out and we're telling the gospel to zombies. Maybe walking around spiritually they're dead. I like the vision of Ezekiel, chapter 37, where there's the, va- the valley, right? It's the valley of dry bones. And Ezekiel's got to preach. That's what we're doing. We're preaching to the Valley of Dry Bones when we go do evangelism. We're talking to people who are dead in their sin. Unless the Spirit of God comes and brings life, we're talking to the graveyard. Dead in sin, not sick. Therefore, it's impossible for us to do anything. You and I can't raise people from the dead. God can. People outside of God are unable to respond to God. Did you know that? Let me just read some passages. Romans 8, 7. So all these are about unbelievers and the the, the fact that they are morally unable unless God does something. God's got to remove the scales. Romans 8, 7. The mind that is set on the flesh, unbelievers, is hostile to God for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It's unable to respond to God. On their own. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says the same thing. The natural person, speaking of unbelievers as opposed to the spiritual person, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. See that inability again? He's not able. So here we are talking to people who are unable to respond left to themselves. Jesus 2, John 6.44. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. There it is. No one can. There's that inability. No one's going to come to Christ unless the Father draws him, which is why we pray, Father, would you draw them? A little bit later, actually a little bit before the Gospel of John, Jesus said this, though. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And so here we are preaching to the graveyard, preaching to people who are unable to respond. What we need is God to come in and open the heart. Listen to the story of Lydia in Acts chapter 16, verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. She was Jewish. The Lord, here it is, opened her heart to pay attention to, To what was said by Paul, that's our prayer request. As we go and we share the gospel, we've got to pray, Lord, would you do this? Lord, would you draw? Lord, would you make them able? Lord, would you open their heart to hear what I'm trying to say? Otherwise, it's going to fall off, water off a duck's back. And so we've got to pray for God to save because the conversions of the Lord. How does this help us? How does this understanding help us in evangelism? One, we realize that God must save. We realize we're dependent, so we've got to pray for God to do the work. You know, we sing a song called Grace Alone. I love this line. I was an orphan, lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear your call. But, Father, you worked your will. Love that line. Maybe one of the favorite lines we sing at Southside. And this is what we're praying. They're they're orphans. They're lost. They're running when God calls. Father, would you work your will? (laughs) Overcome their inability. And so this is why we must pray. Knowing that God must save also helps us focus on faithfulness rather than results. At the end of the day, again, we can't raise people from the dead. We preach the gospel and leave the results to God. We just want to be faithful. It gives us confidence, right? 
This should give us confidence. We can't do anything. You may be a really persuasive person. You may know a lot of Bible. You may be really good at apologetics. You can't raise people from the dead. God's got to do that. And so it gives us confidence in our evangelism. God's going to save. God can. God will. All who come to him, all that the Father's given them, will come. And so we have confidence in our evangelism. Knowing that God saves also helps us persevere with the hardest of hearts. We can persevere in our evangelism. I've been reading a little bit about uh, Judson and, and uh, Kerry and, and Fuller lately, a bunch of Baptist missionaries. So Judson was a missionary in Burma. He didn't see his first convert for six years. Can you imagine that? Six years with very little fruit. William Carey was in India. Seven years of sharing the gospel until his first convert. What held them there? Well, this belief that God is sovereign and God can save and God will save. And so it helps us persevere even when we, you know, have hard hearts that we think could never come to the Lord. And then it just gives, all, gives God all the glory, understanding this. Keeps the glory focused on him, right? 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God. And so we pray. We pray for God to save as we're out. God, would you do this? I, on my own, am a jar of clay. I'm a little like Walmart sack so that the power of the gospel can go forth. So we pray that. We pray for opportunities. Or let me encourage you. Let me just stop. Do you pray for opportunities to share the gospel? That's a prayer God loves to answer. Lord, give me a softball today. Would you just, I just, would you just make it easy? Would you just bring someone to me and says, what must I do to be saved? It may not go exactly like that, but God loves to answer that prayer. So pray for opportunities. Pray daily for opportunities. Pray for brokenness for the lost. You know, the other reason, one of the main reasons we don't evangelize is, is we fear people. One of the other reasons, for real, we just don't care enough. We're not burdened for the lost. Like Paul was. Listen to what Paul says. Romans 9, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Just ask, do you have this, any, can you even relate at all to this sorrow he has? This unceasing sorrow? Listen to the way Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus had compassion. He was broken. This word, it's a real visceral word. Actually, literally, it's sometimes used for guts. He was moved from his internal organs. He had compassion. He was broken. So pray for a brokenness. You don't care about your lost neighbor? Pray, God, would you help me to care? You know I'm supposed to care. Would you help me? So pray for a broken for the lost. Do you pray for the lost? Do you pray for lost people? Romans 10.1, again, Paul, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. And so we need to pray that God would save people again. Praying for people, praying by name. The SBC, a couple years ago, we got involved, uh, had a really helpful initiative, I think, and it was called Who's Your One? And so I just ask you this, who's your one? Who's the one unbeliever in your life? Probably most of you already have the name on the tip of your tongue. Pray for them regularly, that God would save them. I was asked a, a really convicting question. I try to ask you guys pretty periodically, what would happen if God answered every one of your prayers for the last month? If God said yes, green light, to every single prayer you prayed in the last four weeks, what would happen? Would you and yours be, you know, healthy and wealthy and prosperous? It's a good question, isn't it? Paint stings a little bit. <laughs> what are we praying for? Would we all just be people free of physical pain or free of any discomfort that might actually lead us to depend on the Lord? Or would dozens of people be saved because we're praying for them? So we need to pray for this broken for the lost. Have you all seen this Penn and Teller video? Let's see if we got it up here. Uh, Penn, they were, they're magicians, they're atheists, um, but he tells a story of uh, someone who came and tried to evangelize on him. 
And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Ouch, right? I don't, I don't think Penn or Taylor, I forget which is which, uh, is a Christian, but at least he understood, look, if we believe in eternal hell, we believe in eternal heaven, it's hateful not to proselytize. And so we need to, we need to have a brokenness and a boldness. Charles Spurgeon, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself, be sure of that. And so we need to pray. We'll pray that we would care more. Ultimately, we'd care more about God. We'd care more about his glory. We'd care more about his gospel. We'd care more about people. And so how do we get there? We're all not there. It's so easy to make everyone feel guilty about evangelism. But I want to urge you, let's, we're all there. Let's just pray. God would change us. Third, know the gospel. Know the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, at Southside, I think, I think the first time I saw this was J.I. Packer. We like to summarize it with these four hooks. God, sin, Christ, response. Easy way for you to just keep it in your back pocket. When you share the gospel, you want to hit these four points depending on how long you have with someone, but you want to talk about God. And usually you want to just talk about some of the essential aspects. Everyone in America is just going to assume God is loving. Of course God is loving. Of course God loves me. What's not to love? Yes, we want to say God is loving. That's true. But also the aspect that they probably haven't heard as much is he's holy and he's sovereign and he's in control and he's powerful. And so God is the creator, and he's holy and loving. And then the next step in the story is sin. All people have sinned and thought, word, and deed. And so we are separated from God, and that's a problem. If God is holy and we're sinful, that's the bad news. And really, we've got to set up the bad news before we get to the good news. Gospel just means good news, and that comes with Christ. God himself hasn't left us to ourselves, but has sent his son to come, die on a cross, in the place of sinners. And you may not have to use this word, but the theological doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement needs to be there. The idea that Christ died for sinners. He bore the penalty on our behalf. That element of substitution, again, you may not use that language, but the fact that we deserve to die and Christ died in our place needs to be shared or the full gospel hasn't been shared. In fact, we saw that. Let me go back to 2 Corinthians 5. That's how he concludes his exhortation, verse 18. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciled. And remember, reconciliation is when there were former enemies, now there's friends. He reconciled us and gave us the ministry. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we need to know this gospel, study this gospel, his life, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation. And then we need to call for a response, faith and repentance. Trust in Christ, turn from sin. God's sin, Christ's response. So know the gospel and put your confidence there. Not in yourself, but in the gospel. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for because... It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. Paul's not ashamed of the message. Why? Because that message is invested with power, impregnated with power. It's where it's at. And so we rely on that. Our job is to be faithful to that message. And is that message amazing, isn't it? Is this message has traveled across the world, it changes people and it changes things. God has invested the message with power. Flip with me to Romans 10, verse 14. Our, 
confidence is in the word, not in ourselves. So we need to know the gospel that we might share it faithfully. Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed what he's heard from us? So faith, this is what we want, right? We want people to have faith. Faith comes from hearing. And how does hearing come? Through the word. Through the word of Christ, through the gospel, through the message. This is what God uses to save. And so we put all our chips in the gospel. It has the power. So we need to know the gospel. You ever heard the saying, uh, it's often attributed to Francis of Assisi. Francis of Assisi actually didn't say this. But you've heard the saying, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. You heard that? It's nonsensical. It's not a good statement. It's like saying, feed the hungry at all times. If necessary, use food. <laughs> Can I have your address? If necessary, use numbers. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Why? The gospel consists of words. There is no gospel without words. Yes, we should live a, a lifestyle, an example, and all that, yes. But the gospel is words. So there is no preaching the gospel without words. So we want to put confidence in the gospel. We also don't want to put confidence in our own story. You know, sometimes we, I think, overemphasize our own testimony. The power is not in our own story. The power is in the gospel. So as you have opportunities to share your story and share your testimony, make sure the gospel's in there. It's a beautiful way to do it. Most people want to hear about you and you want to hear about other people. And as you're sharing, put the gospel in the middle of your testimony. Make it clear. Lots of other ways we could talk about uh, summarizing the gospel. Uh, you could do it more in story form. Cradle, cross, crown. You could do a bigger picture, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and talk about the bigger picture. And you talk about how things were created good, but they're messed up. And through the gospel, they're restored and ultimately where everything's headed. You could do it with creation, sin, exile, return, or restoration. The idea that we are all lost, that, that theme of exile. Uh, we're not at home. This world's not our home. There's lots of ways to share the gospel. You can, again, just read the New Testament and see how they share the gospel. Trevin Wax defines the gospel this way. I thought it was a helpful definition, pretty broad, comprehensive def definition. The gospel is the royal announcement that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived a perfect life in our place, died a substitutionary death on the cross for our sins, rose triumphantly from the grave to launch God's new creation and is now exalted as king of the world. Notice, you know, that's kind of wordy, but what's there? It's good news about Jesus, his life, he lived a perfect life, died in our place on the cross, resurrection, to launch God's new creation, and now he's the king. So what is, what's there? Incarnation, life, death, resurrection, exaltation, just the basics of the gospel. Know that really well for your own life, but also for sharing the gospel. Know the gospel. And don't forget that last part, exalted as king of the world. Don't so emphasize atonement that we lose enthronement. Sometimes that happens. He is Lord of the world because of his resurrection. And that's actually the emphasis you'll find in the New Testament. Sometime read the book of Acts and just look at how they shared the gospel. More often than not, they're saying Jesus is Lord. Why did they get in trouble? Acts 17, they're saying there's another king. Jesus exalted to the right hand of God. And so you don't find language that we often use, especially in Baptist circles, of like, just accept Jesus in your heart. Like, that's never used in the Bible, actually. What do you find when they go about preaching? Submit to the Lord. Submit to the world's true Lord, who will come back to judge the living and the dead. So he now has authority because of his resurrection and exaltation. This causes uh, one writer named John Dixon, Australian guy, to speak of the mission equation. Here it is. If there is one Lord... To whom all people belong and owe their allegiance. The people of that Lord must promote this reality everywhere. Let me say it again. If there is one Lord, and there is, to whom all people belong and owe their allegiance, the people of that Lord must promote this reality everywhere. So part of that message is his authority. You need to submit to him. You need to obey him. Trusting him for forgiveness and then following him with all your life. 
So we're ambassadors then of this king. He's got all authority. We're ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5.20. What are ambassadors? They're authorized representatives of a sovereign. It's a secular word. Ambassadors deliver a message from a king. We represent the foreign power of the kingdom. We don't write the message. We don't edit the message. We don't soften the message to make it a little more palatable to postmodern people. No, no, no. We take the message from point A to point B. That's what the job of an ambassador is. Faithfully get the message across. Don't change it. So we preserve it, we know it, and then we deliver it. And man, when you know the gospel, again, join me in praying this. Every one of us, our hearts are too cold to the gospel right now. If we really thought about it, really understood God's holiness, really understood our own sinfulness, we would be much more active for Christ. And so we need to pray, Lord, light me up like my heart should be lit up for the gospel. When we truly know the gospel, it should compel us. That's why he said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, love of Christ controls us. Listen to Acts 4, 20. Again, the book of Acts, so good, early church. We cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Is that you going about having opportunities? Because you've been redeemed by the blood, I cannot but speak. Can't help it. Listen again to Spurgeon. If Jesus is precious to you, as he is to the Spirit, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You'll be whispering it into your child's ear. You'll be telling it to your husband. You'll be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you'll be more than eloquence. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. It cannot be that there's a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. If you really know Christ, you're like one that's found honey. You'll call others to taste of its sweetness. You're like the beggar who's discovered an endless supply of food. You must go tell the hungry crowd that you found Jesus and you're anxious that they should find him too. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. You either try to spread the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. And so know the gospel, love the gospel. Fourth, be bold. Be bold. This kind of goes with fear in the Lord, right? Be bold. Life is a vapor. The things of this world are lousy. Eternity is long. Hell is hot. Jesus is Lord. We need to just grow in boldness. We just need to jump in. You know, two ways to get into a pool. You know, dip the toe a little bit. That's Alicia style. Just dip it. Little boy style. Just, just launch in. Just dive in. With evangelism, we just need to launch. Just jump in. Take risks. And here's the beauty of evangelism. As you take risk and as you're bold, your faith will be invigorated. Forget about you, lose you, lose your life. John 12, 25, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Be bold. Who cares if you get pushed back? You might get pushed back. 1 Peter 4, 13, rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. You believe that? It's blessed to be insulted for the name of Christ. If you're persecuted, be happy about it. Again, those early Christians, they leave after being persecuted. Acts 5.41, quote, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Someone ever like make fun of your views of sexuality or call you a bigot or call you arrogant? What's our normal response, our fleshly response? To show them how wrong he is, to be defensive, to be depressed. What were the early church, what was the early Christians? They rejoiced. They were, man, I was worthy to suffer a little bit for the name of Christ. Believe the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 10, and 12. You're blessed when you're persecuted. Blessed are those. The word blessed there is happy, makarios. Happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you. Happy are you <laughs> and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We need to believe these words. Again, we need to just love the Lord so much that we count it, count it a joy to be inconvenient for the sake of him. Be bold. Don't be timid. Do you lack boldness? Once again, pray for boldness. Pray 
Not where you want to be? Ask, Lord, I'm not bold. Would you help me to be bold? Acts chapter 4, verse 29, the Jewish leadership releases Peter and John. And notice what they say, Acts 4, 29. O Lord, keep us safe and secure and give us traveling mercies. It doesn't say that. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They're persecuted, they're released, and they pray, Lord, would you keep us bold? This just really cost us. Who knows what it's going to cost us in the future? Lord, would you help us to keep preaching the word with boldness? Who do you think was the most bold person in the New Testament? Really no one right answer, but Jesus. Okay, second. Got Jesus juked. Stephen. Oh, that's good. I wasn't thinking of him, but yeah, Stephen. I was thinking of Paul. Peter, they're all bold, right? They're all, they all put us to shame. But we've got a lot about Paul, especially in the book of Acts. I, I don't know if this is true in terms of calculating it, but I'd imagine it is that the main, if not one of the main, prayer requests that Paul had was for boldness. Did you ever notice that? The Apostle Paul, as he writes to his churches, would you pray for me that I'd be bold? Let me just read a few. Ephesians 6.18. Paul says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. What's his prayer request right here? That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So if the Apostle Paul is praying for boldness in evangelism, probably, probably a good example for us to do the same. Colossians 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. He's in prison. Just pray that I'd get the gospel clearer. Pray that I would be bold with the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. And so be bold and pray for more Boldness. Be bold. Boldness is really just living under the lordship of Jesus. It's living with intentionality. That's the main problem, I think, in the Christian life with marriage and with parenting, with prayer, with the word, with all things, really, with evangelism, is we're just, we just lose intentionality, right? We just get the culture and our own sin and the devil just pushes us into ruts. And we're, we're not on living on intention anymore. Again, same thing with marriage. Same with, when we're on... And we have the right perspective, things usually go well. We honor the Lord. The problem is we're often not. And so let's resolve together to live with intention, to live with these lordship lenses, looking at the world as if we're Christians, looking at the world as if Jesus is Lord and people live for all eternity. Abraham Kuyper said that every square inch on planet earth is owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a square inch where he doesn't say mine. That's true. C.S. Lewis said there's not a square inch or a split second that is not claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And so we need to live with this sort of intention. Going about our normal, everyday life with the Lordship of Christ in the front of our mind. Living intentionally. That's what most of us do, right? Uh, my fa- one of my favorite quotes from a book called Total Church, uh, Tim Chester and Steve Timmons. Most gospel ministry consists of ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. That's the key. We're very ordinary people. Most of us do very ordinary things, but we do it with this intentionality. We view all people from lordship lenses. Back to 2 Corinthians 5, that's what he said. He said, from now on, verse 16, we regard no one according to the flesh. The NIV is a little bit clearer here. Let me read it. It says, the new NIV says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Now that we're in Christ, we don't look at people from a worldly point of view anymore. Now we look at people as those made in the image of God, separated from their creator and in desperate need of redemption. That's the way now we view people. We don't look at people from a worldly point of view anymore, from a fleshly perspective. We look at people differently now, new creation lenses. And so again, we just got to open our eyes, right? We can go about our day. We get so busy and we got so many burdens and we can view people just in a worldly way, just... We can avoid conversations. We can view people in one of three ways. as scenery, machinery, or ministry. 
scenery, we just, we just, you know, they're just whatever. And most people, what are we doing now with scenery? We're, you know, that's what we're doing. Looking at our phones. We're not noticing what's around us or machinery. They're just here to serve us, you know. Uh, they're just, I'm just fulfilling a task, thinking about going to the grocery store. Yeah, you've got a practical need. You need to go to the grocery store, but you can go to the grocery store and view that person as more than just machinery, an opportunity, a ministry. And so it's just being on. It's being on. It's being intentional. It makes life fun, right? It makes a, a, a mundane trip to the grocery store all of a sudden packed with some adventure. Hey, I'm going to strike up a conversation on this trip. Got lordship lenses on. And so be on for the Lord. Again, William Carey, expect big, attempt big. Expect big, attempt big. Expect big things from God, attempt big things for him. Be bold. Slay the dragon of the fear of man. Defy timidity. Wrestle it to the ground. We need to have dominion over our little weak wills. Living for this world and just for the task right in front of us. We have the gospel. We have the word of God. We have the spirit of God. Let's be bold. Acts 1.8. You, Jesus says to his people, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria. When the Spirit comes, there's the power of the Spirit leads to witness. So be bold. We have what we need. Be bold because God lets us be a part of what he's doing. Again, he doesn't need us, right? He doesn't need us to raise people from the dead. We're unessential in that regard. He lets us be a part of what he's doing. His command... To share the gospel is an invitation to joy. It's an invitation to a life worth living. We get to be used by a sovereign God to bring people from death to life as we share the gospel. That ought to cause us to live with boldness. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons that we now share testimonies of new members at our members' meetings is to fuel evangelism, believe it or not. Because what you'll hear again and again and again and again is... Yeah, my coach shared the gospel with me when I was in eighth grade. Yeah, my parents shared the gospel with me. Or I heard the gospel at this. Ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality and God saves people. We get to be a part of it. I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing that we get to be a part of this. What did the text say? 2 Corinthians 5. God making his appeal through us. Isn't that incredible? When the Spirit goes to work... And we're talking with somebody, God himself, the sovereign creator, is making his appeal through your mouth. No greater privilege in the world. Max Stiles puts it this way, the privilege is ours. The greatest thing about evangelism is that we get to do it, you and me. Somehow, the great creator God allows us protoplasmic specks in the universe to partner with him and his grand design. It's a wonder and a mystery. And so be bold. Evangelism's hard. It's probably always going to be hard. So we just have to dive in and get over it. Number five, ask questions. Ask questions. We often, as Christians, get backed in the corner, don't we? We often are the ones that are forced to have to answer all the hard questions. But again, if you ever study the tactics of Jesus... What is he often doing when he's talking especially to antagonists? He answers questions with questions. Jesus asks a ton of questions. And so when it comes to the hard stuff, yeah, give answers, but also ask follow-up questions as you're talking with people. Ask them about the hard stuff, the ultimate questions. Ask them their thoughts. Well, what's your view of the origin of the world? I believe in a creator. Where do you think we came from? Oh, yeah, like crystals or nothing or soup just exploded? Huh, interesting. Seems... Rational or not, it takes a lot of faith, right? What about the problem of evil? Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but what do, you th- what do you think about the problem of evil? Better, how do you define evil? I define evil anything against God's word. What's your standard for evil? Where do you think the world's headed? What's the purpose of your life? Like, what's your main goal? What's the telos? I believe that, that humans are made in the image of God. What's your basis for human dignity? Why do you think people ought to be valued? Asking them questions about their world. But not just like apologetic type questions. Use questions to turn the conversation. This is the hardest part, isn't it? You start talking with somebody. Okay, I got this conversation going. How can I, how can I turn it to the gospel? It's challenging. How do we get to the gospel? This is a skill to be learned. It's a skill to be cultivated. How do we move from small talk to the gospel? It's a little easier for me because small talk pretty quickly with guys especially. So what do you do? 
You know, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. You want to have a conversation now or go ahead and jump in or you want to wait a little while? I mean, here we go. I'm a Baptist minister, man. <laughs> but use good questions. What about you? you? You consider yourself religious? You have a spiritual background? Did your parents believe anything? You have any spiritual interests? What's your faith background? Ask, just ask questions about their background. Let them talk. Most people love to talk about themselves, so get them talking. Or just go straight in. What do you think about Jesus Christ? You ever wondered if Jesus really rose from the grave? If he really rose from the grave, man, what does that mean for you? You ever thought about how the Christian church exploded from 12 dudes to, what are we at now? I don't know, four, two billion something? You ever thought about how that happened? It's because the tomb was empty. What do you think about the empty tomb? What do you think about Jesus? Get them talking or thinking about Jesus. I was able to do this this week with my barber. Started talking about Jesus because he was like, you know, this is my, so this is my one, this is my one contact. And uh, he's very honest with me and I love it. Uh, so I can't repeat most of what he says. <laughs> but he said, you know, this is why, this is the problem. All religions are the same. It's just be good. Don't be, don't be crummy. It's my edited version. Um, but man, most of the religious people I've been to, and he actually has a really sad story burned by the, by the Catholic Church, but um, most, of, most of the Christians are really crummy people. And you know what? Actually, you know who Jesus went hardest against? Hypocrisy. And actually, he never heard it. Really? I said, oh man, you got to read Matthew 23. You need to go. Here's your homework, man. I'll be back in three weeks. Go read Matthew 23 and hear Jesus go hard after hypocrisy and you can tell it oh yeah really I've seen a meme where Jesus like turned over a table or something I'm like yes that's it you know who he was upset with the hip hypocrites anyway get them talking about Jesus get them thinking about Jesus very few people want to dismiss Jesus certainly don't want to criticize them get them talking about the resurrection so how do you explain the rise of Christianity ask for their again their big questions of life ask them just what do you mean tell me what do you mean by that how do you know how do you know that get them talking what difference has that made in your life? Is that working for you? If you're wrong, what would the consequences be for you? If you're wrong, what would the consequences be for others? Again, you, you can come up with a whole lot better questions than that. Ask good questions. But you know what's even more challenging in Abilene, Texas? The next question. Because in Abilene, Texas, once you turn the conversation, so you finally get there, finally get there, all right, all right, hey, you got a spiritual background? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. That's what you're going to find 99% of the time in Abilene. Then what? Yeah, no, you're not. <laughs> this is the hardest part. Why? Because the vast majority of Abilenians profess to be Christians. Many professors, less possessors. We don't know the heart, but we know that Abilene is filled with false converts, right? In Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus' scariest words, Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then they mention even some religious, really supernatural religious things they did. And Jesus will say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. And so there are droves of people in Abilene, Texas that are going to hear those words. They think they know the Lord, and they don't. People who, to use the language of 2 Timothy 3, 5, they have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. What we could call nominal Christians, in-name only Christians. This was me, man, for 18 years. You had to ask me if I was a Christian. I said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Who doesn't? I live in West Texas. This is where evangelism in Abilene actually is really hard. It's really hard. I was uh, in Columbia last week. It was a group of pastors. One of the guys was from Seattle. And uh, Seattle's different than Abilene. We were talking about evangelism. And for him, man, he's got to start, he's got to start like way ground level. You know, we can assume a lot. People understand the, the God of the Bible. They understand the category of sin and guilt. I mean, he's starting with hardly any Christian category at all. And we were just talking. It's like, man, I'm, I'm jealous of you in some ways. It's really easy uh, to do evangelism in Seattle in terms of getting there. For us to do evangelism in Abilene, first we've got to convince them that they're probably not saved and then share the gospel. It's really challenging to do that. So many people here have been gospel inoculated. What's an inoculation? You know, we give you a little measles so you don't get a lot later. And that's the problem. Many people think they have the gospel because at some point in their past, some pastor has manipulated them to walk an aisle or sign a card or pray a prayer, and they think they're good. They haven't thought about Jesus the rest of their lives, but they think, oh, yeah, I did that back then. They've been inoculated. They think they have the gospel. They really have a distorted, truncated, reduced version of it. And again, this was me until college. 
probably many of you. And so what do we do when we have a conversation with someone here in Abilene and they say they're a Christian? Well, here's what we can't do. We can't leave it at that. We can't leave it at that in Abilene, Texas. If we do, we'll never get anywhere with evangelism here. We have to ask the next question. And this is hard because what we're doing is we're, we are, we're doing a little bit of confrontation. We're basically questioning them. We're asking for a little bit of evidence. We want them to think about it. Okay, oh yeah, you're a Christian, great. We want them to get thinking. And listen, if they're actually Christians, if they're actually regen- regenerate, spirit-filled believers, they shouldn't get offended. They shouldn't get offended. In fact, they should be refreshed. I don't know about y'all. Has anyone ever tried to evangelize you? Three or four. Don't you love it? I love when people try to evangelize on me. <laughs> I'm just like, this person loved God enough and loved me enough to try to have a conversation. I just want to hug them. I'm like, man, I'm on the team, but I almost want to let you just share the gospel and get saved again to encourage your faith. <laughs> and so when we ask the next question, if they're not actually saved, they probably will get offended. They probably will. But the Holy Spirit might just use that, that little irritation, to open their eyes. How dare he? How dare he question if I'm a Christian? I'm a, I'm a Christian. All right? I think. What is a Christian? You know, we're putting a little pebble in the shoe and praying the Spirit would make it bigger until he has to take it off. Hard words, man. This week it was incur- really encouraging more than once. So, so many of the pastors we saw in Columbia uh, basically had come from charismatic Pentecostal prosperity churches and been, and been basically introduced to sound doctrine. And so many of the testimonies we heard were someone coming along with a confronting word. Hey, that's wrong. Or, hey, your preaching's unbiblical. Were they offended at first? You bet. But the Lord used it ultimately to bring people to the truth. And so that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. Man, this is what I needed someone to do for me. And I'm so thankful that eventually it happened. So here's what we get. We get to ask the next question. So develop some good second questions. That way you're ready beforehand. So come up with your own. I think I'm weak here. I'm not creative. But here's seven ideas that you can take from. So they tell you, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm from Abilene. Of course I'm born again. Oh, that's great. How are you growing spiritually? Just get them talking about their spiritual growth. And if they're like, well, you know what? I'm, I love my church. I'm in the Word. Oh, good, man. Praise God. God's blessing be upon you. Growing spiritually, what do you mean? What do you mean growing spiritually? Well, like, you know, we're called to be conformed to the image of Jesus. How are you doing that? Uh, I go to church sometimes. Okay, now we can talk. Or where do you go to church? So, <laughs> never mind. I'll be nice. Where do you go to church? Just ask where they go to church. What do you love about the Bible? Man, I'm a Christian too. Don't you love God's word that he didn't keep us in the dark? I love the book of Romans. What's, what's your favorite part of scripture? What's your favorite part of God's character? Get them talking about the Lord. Usually, pretty quickly, you're going to see if someone has a heart for the Lord or not. When did you first understand and believe the gospel? I'm born in Abilene. What do you mean? My grandpa was Presbyterian. Me too. How do you know you're a believer? Here's a little bit direct. No, I, th- I think this is Eric Richardson's testimony. I wish he was here. I think someone asked him when he was young, on what basis, so, uh, Eric, you're a Christian? On what basis do you think you're a Christian? And it ruined him, wrecked him. And so ultimately God saved him through that hard question. Oh, yeah, you're a Christian? You're a Christian? Why, why do you think so? That's a confrontive question though, isn't it? It's tough. We've got to have boldness here. How does the gospel impact your day-to-day life? So what you're doing, you're asking some follow-up question to get them thinking, to get them talking. And if they've got nothing, man, this is the time to talk about what a Christian is. Maybe it's a time to disciple them, invite them to read the Bible with you. So there's a little book, I think it's in the end, I'll share it with you, but there's a little one-to-one Bible reading. It's just guides on how to read the Bible. Maybe say, hey man, let's read the book of Ephesians together. Spend six weeks reading scripture together, invite them in. In some ways, what you want to do is treat them as if they're saved and let the Spirit go to work. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're a Christian. Let's do Ephesians. God says you grow by the Word. Let's walk together. You want to do that? And either they'll realize 
that they weren't saved and be saved, or maybe they were actually saved and had a really infantile faith and they'll grow. Invite them to church. You know, there's a lot of bad churches out there, right? Sadly, there's not a lot of churches that preach the word. Christians will not grow without the word being preached. No maturation without the milk of the word. And so invite them here. I love the way Cooper and Andrea shared their testimony as they joined. And Cooper used the imagery of coming to Southside and having a growth spurt. Uh, That tends to happen at this church. Why? Because the book's open and the Spirit of God promises to work through the book. And so invite them here. There's a lot of churches where they're not going to hear the gospel clearly. They're not going to hear the word. I used to feel weird about that. You know, you're you're stealing sheep. We don't want to steal sheep. But if it's a rescue, we'll rescue some sheep. So invite them here. Share the full gospel. Disciple them. Talk to them about what Christians love to do. Point them to 1 John. Did you know the book of 1 John is in the canon of Scripture to make sure we're children of God? He tells us this is why he wrote. Make sure you're a Christian. And so either just if you don't have time, hey, you should go read 1 John. It, it really will help you out. Or maybe you get to read them, read it with them. Three, 1 John has three main tests to know whether we're really children of God. Number one, the knowledge of Christ. Number two, obedience. And number three, love for the body. Do they really even know who Christ is first? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Lord? Is he, are they obeying? It's a big part of 1 John. Those who love the Lord obey. And then third, they love the flock. They love the body. They love the local church. And that one's really important in Abilene. Again, this is super hard, super offensive. But they need to know that if they're not part of a local church, they should have no assurance that they're born again. They may be. But they shouldn't have assurance that they are. Listen to just a couple verses from 1 John, 1 John 3, 14. How do we know who a Christian is? We know that we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. How do you know someone's a Christian? They love the local church, brothers and sisters, their family, their faith family. If someone won't even show up on a Sunday, they don't love their brothers and sisters. And there's a lot of people in Abilene who claim to be Christians who are not part of a local church. 1 John 4, 20, if you actually love God, you'll love the church. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he's seen. Sorry, let me start that over. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So you can't have someone that claims to love God, doesn't love the church. And again, some people say, yeah, I love the church. You know, this ethereal category, it's really easy to love the church, but despise people. No, no, no. Do you love people, the people in your local church that you committed to follow the Lord with? The Lord's will is that you follow him in the context of a local church. Not to mention the 50-something one and others that they're not obeying. Christians obey God. Not to mention Hebrews 10.25 that commands us to go to church weekly. And so we're asking questions. We're asking good apologetic questions. We're, we're putting it on them. We're asking good conversation turning questions, asking good follow-up questions, developing good second questions. So grow in this skill of asking good questions. And then sixth, make disciples. Jesus commanded us to make disciples, not decisions. In some of our circles, I don't really think this is a Southside problem, but we've reduced the Great Commission to make converts when Jesus says, make disciples, so we don't stop with conversion. Baptism is not the finish line, but the starting line. Flip over to Matthew 28. The Great Commission. It's given for all Christians, not just missionaries. Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So all disciples are called to make disciples. I think sometimes we hear that command go and think that's only for people who leave. That's not the case. This is for every Christian. In fact, I think we've got a diagram for you. Remember diagramming? The main verb is make disciples in this verse. It's an imperative. And then there are three participles that modify what it means to make disciples. So because Jesus has all authority, therefore, 
We are to make disciples as we go, wherever we go. Going, baptizing, and teaching. And part of what we do then in this task is we teach them everything Jesus commanded us to teach. What did Jesus, what is part, in some ways, what is the heart of what Jesus taught his disciples to do? Make disciples. And so there's a real sense, and if we're not making disciples, we're not disciples. Disciples are those who make disciples. We are disciples who make disciples, one of our core values. What is disciples? It's just helping people follow the Lord. In this case, we're talking about taking people from unbelief to belief to following the Lord. So as we share the gospel, we're aiming to persuade. And so we want to have that hard question. We have a good conversation. We're able to share the gospel. We need to ask them to commit to Christ. We're not manipulating emotions here, but we want to call for a response. A good question is, is there anything holding you back from coming to Christ today? What would keep you from doing it today? Aim to persuade. And as we urge them, we're sharing the cost of following Jesus. Jesus never said, follow me and your life's going to get easier. Kind of said the opposite, right? (laughs) What does the invitation include? Not fulfill yourself, not you do you, but You deny yourself, you take up your cross, and you follow him. The cross is an instrument of execution. That's the call, right? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So they need to know that. We need to tell them that. Listen, man, are you sure? To come to Christ is the end of you. So we want to make sure that we share the full message. His call is hard, but it's worth it. Jesus would share the cost so much, sometimes it almost seemed like he was trying to talk people out of following. You ever notice that? Flip over to Luke 14. So we want to we call them to commit, but we want to make sure they understand the cost. We don't want someone fizzling out the best we can. Luke 14, verse 25. Great crowds accompanied him. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, And does not hate his own father and wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross, come after me, cannot be my disciple. Which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down, count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, not able to finish it, I'll see it and begin to mock him. This saying, this man began to build, wasn't able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king of war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him? Who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the others yet great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So we want to tell them, listen, this will cost you your life. You want to trust Christ? Praise God. You understand what this is going to require of you. Make sure our message is the same as that of Jesus. What did he say? Repent and believe. It's not just, hey, Accept him. It's repent and believe. You must make a decision here, and it's a lifestyle decision. You must turn from sin. Repentance must be included in our message. It's a a return to God as the center of life. It's a total surrender to a sovereign Lord. It's a reorienting of ourselves around God as the center, turning from sin and sinning to God and godliness. Faith is turning to. Repentance is turning from. We're taking ourselves off the throne and putting Christ on the throne. Packer defines repentance this way. A change of mind and heart, a new life of denying self and serving the Savior as king in self's place. Mr. Self is dethroned, Christ is enthroned. So that's it, friends. Fear the Lord, pray, know the gospel, be bold, ask questions, and make disciples in the task of evangelism. A couple of encouragements, and then I'll talk books. Uh, First encouragement, do you know who the most fruitful evangelists in the world are? Moms. Moms. That's exactly right. 94% of people come to faith before the age of 18. And so moms, especially moms with little ones, you're like, man, I have no opportunities. I'm up to my knees in, in divers. Be encouraged. You're doing a good work. Most people come to faith in the home because of mama. And so press on and persevere. Don't think that there's something better out there. Wish I was doing something out there. No, no. C.S. Lewis says, children are not a distraction from 
more important work. They are the most important work. And so be content in your current lot. There will be more opportunities later for other types of ministry, but your current ministry is so significant. Second, be encouraged. Most, the vast majority of evangelistic encounters will be a dud. (laughs) Most of the time. They'll be what we consider dud encounters. But in reality, they're not. Why? Because our job is not to see results. Our job is to be faithful to the gospel. That's what he's called us to do. We're ambassadors. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. So we get to plant, we get to water, God's going to give the growth. Neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. God's going to do it. We get to be a part. And who knows, maybe if someone is ultimately going to come to faith and we just got to be part of the planting, part of the watering. Someone eventually will bring the harvest, but at the end of the day, uh, we're doing something. I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I have a gift of evangelism. I feel like it's pretty easy for me to talk with people and, and turn the conversation and be bold. I have very little evangelistic fruit in my own life in terms of seeing people saved. I hope that I've planted a ton and watered a ton. And that's what we're called to do. So be encouraged. (laughs) Let me mention some books. So we've got some here. I don't have, it's kind of like first come, first serve. We don't have one forever. I don't think we might. But um, got several copies of this little book here. So these are all free. Um, What if I'm discouraged in my evangelism? (laughs) Sign me up. So grab those. If you're not, you can grab them online. I also have a couple tracks. So um, these are helpful. A couple of them in particular by Matthias Media are, re- Media are really good. Two Ways to Live, Two Roads. And uh, you can Google that, Two Ways to Live, Matthias Media. Really helpful resources on a basic gospel presentation. Um, so you can grab that. Also got a couple tracks on What is the Gospel uh, by Greg Gilbert. Uh, just again, using that God, sin, Christ response. Let me mention some books. I'd encourage you to uh, read a book on evangelism every few years. Just like if you're married, read a marriage book every couple of years. If you're, if you're a parent, read a parent. Just stay fresh. Again, we get in that rut. We get in those ruts after a while. A good book will just kind of get you back. So let me mention a few of these. Am I Really a Christian by Mike McKinley. I don't have any of these to give away. Sorry. I don't think. But uh, first one, I mean, a really good book for someone that's not sure. So you could have a few copies of that in your car and get to meet somebody. You know what? This is like the most important question in the world. Are you actually a Christian? Here's a book. Figure that out. Uh, conversion by Michael Lawrence. So I mentioned earlier con- our doctrine of conversion, so important for evangelism and a whole host of other things. So that's a small book. I've got one to give away, actually, that one. Really good book. Michael Lawrence, pastor in Seattle, or Portland, I mean. Evangelism by Mac Stiles. We had Mac here. If you weren't here, you can find that on our YouTube page. Mac talked about missions as evangelism. Well worth your time. Uh, good little red book. You know what I don't have on there? Oh, no, we've got more. Never mind. Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, J.I. Packer. Just a classic, modern-day classic, really short as well. Talks about the, that dynamic, but superb. I've actually got a little book. Uh, how about that title? Missional Ecclesiology. All that means is that the church, ecclesiology, is missional by nature, meaning all of Christians are sent. That's kind of the basic premise of the book. It it's, covers a lot of scriptural ground, but the idea is that you are sent to wherever you are. So where you are in Abilene, you're sent here, at least for now, as an ambassador. So it helps you think through the sent nature of the church. One-to-one Bible reading, I mentioned that, uh, David Helm. That's, that's really helpful, just basic guides to sit down and read scripture with someone. It's also good for D groups, by the way. Uh, gives you guide to read scripture together. Tell the Truth by Will Metzger. This one's big, biggest one up there. It's weighty, lots of theology. But overall, probably my favorite evangelism book. But it's, it's not light, so heads up. The Gospel and Personal Evangelism by Mark Dever. A short, really helpful book. Best Kept Secret, Christian Mission by John Dixon. Uh, not as good as the others, still worth reading. This is my favorite Max Stiles book, The Marks of a Messenger by Max Stiles. Short, easy read, filled with good, good stories. Two Ways to Live, mentioned that. Uh, we got the track by Matthias Media. Uh, they're helpful because they're out of Australia, and again, where they're in post-Christendom, so they're good at starting from the basics. Uh, questioning Evangelism by Randy Newman, Jewish guy that worked on college campuses, and he really pounds home what I mentioned about the way Jesus did evangelism. So it's questioning in the sense of asking questions. A little dated now in terms of cultural issues, but still good. 
I mentioned Isaac Adams, What If I'm Discouraged, and then you want to know the gospel. There, I've got a track here, but there's a little book called What is the Gospel by Greg Gilbert that's just good to know, good to know about. Um, got a couple giveaways, and then we'll be done. All right, so this is here. Don't be shy. I don't want to stay up here long. Understanding the Great Commission, three books on what is the Great Commission. Uh, conversion. Really good book. Then we got, take one at a time. You college kids are going to come just clean us out, aren't you? Facing a Task Unfinished, Cultivating Personal Evangelism Week by Week. I actually haven't read this one. I'm hesitant to recommend books I haven't read, but this is recommended by Alistair Begg. Probably trustworthy. And then a little copy of The Gospel and Personal Evangelism. So I'll just let y'all pick those up. Uh, reminder, next week... Uh, Wednesday at 6, back in the Fellowship Hall, we'll start a new study at six weeks, you know, six, eight weeks on spiritual disciplines. You're all invited, 6 to 7.15, something like that. We'll just talk about the Word and prayer, a little bit more on evangelism, giving, journaling, lots of good, helpful things. So let me pray, and we've got about 10 minutes before you need to go get your kiddos, if you have them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. Uh, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for its clarity. Thank you that it answers all of life's biggest questions. And uh, thank you for the Spirit who gives us power. And thank you for the Spirit who takes dead people and with words about Jesus makes them come alive. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, answer prayers. I pray that we would become more passionate about you. We confess to being cold toward you and the gospel in a way that if we were thinking rightly, we'd be lit up. We confess and we ask for help. We pray for boldness. We pray for opportunities. Would you give us opportunities? Tomorrow, would we have an opportunity? Would you give us just a little softball and uh, may we act on it? God, would you bless our feeble little efforts? We would love to be used by you to bring people to faith. And so we ask for it. Would you do it? More of us would Southside grow by conversion growth. Give us boldness. Pray that you would use us to to pull false assurance from those who have false assurance. We want to see Christ magnified in our own lives. We want to see Christ magnified in uh, the lives of our coworkers and neighbors. And so help us. Help us to that end. We pray for the children represented in this room. Uh, God, that you would grant faith as parents pound home the gospel day by day, week by week, month by month. Would you save them? Use mamas, use daddies um, to bring children to faith and continue to build your church. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you that you allow us to be a part of what you're doing. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.